Hey everybody, we're gonna learn how we can automate all the things, all the code and testing things with GitHub Actions. So who am I? I'm Colby Fayok. I'm the one hugging BB and Kylo Ren over there. I work with the dev community as a developer advocate for app tools. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the web by just Googling my name as I'm the only one in the world. So we're gonna jump right into it. As developers, we have a bunch of tasks that we have to deal with day to day. Particularly, we're going to look at some of those code tasks. So let's see what some of those might look like. Well, first there's linting. Linting basically lets you know if you wrote sloppy code, but on a serious note, it can actually be really helpful for pinpointing syntax errors. It's also generally helpful for making sure your code looks like it's all written from the same person, which makes it easier to read and work through. The problem is unless you're running some kind of modern framework that runs it out of the box, you have to actually remember to run it. Formatting is basically linting, but it fixes all those issues for you. Your linter might even do it itself. But with formatting, you have tools like Prettier, which will format the code and even include an opinionated con uh, configuration. Linting and formatting both come with a lot of super practical benefits, but you also benefit from not having to spend time in code reviews arguing over all those syntax preferences. You can let the robots be the bad cop and actually do it for you. It's less that you have to think about and less that you have to stress about. But again, your worst enemy here is just remembering how to run it. Even more critical to a developer's workflow is testing. While formatting and linting help prevent errors, it's more so static analysis. It helps you find the syntax errors, but it's not doing a lot to actually test the functionality. Tests help to make sure that you're not actually breaking things and end up losing money when your entire online store is down. The tests aren't just for your QA engineer to run every once in a while. You need these tests to be ran regularly. Otherwise, they're not doing their job. And finally, the last thing we're going to talk about is deployments. Ultimately, you want your application to go somewhere. You want people to actually be able to use your application. Deployments can be painful. For large, complex infrastructures, there are a lot of moving pieces. On top of this, you have to remember to deploy all those pieces. Missing one step could take the entire site down, in a bad way, not just because you're deploying a new version and have a little downtime between migrations. A theme through all these tasks, though, are they're all important in one way or another. They help us focus on the real challenges of our work, not drama in a code review or stumbling through another deploy. But another theme is that they all require humans to do it. That means they're all prone to human error, whether it's simply forgetting to run something or forgetting to include a particular step, even forgetting to do it in the right order. So what can we do to help avoid these human mistakes? Well, we can automate it, of course. So let's automate all the things automate all the code and testing things. So how can we actually do that? If we're deploying anything even moderately complex, we have a bunch of things that we need to do in order to actually deploy a full stack. Those 10 commands or buttons that you run every time with the AWS infrastructure, well, we can put that in a script. Scripts are probably the simplest form of automation. This helps us to automate the manual tasks that we might have to take. So why not put them in a bash script or insert your favorite scripting language of choice? You can even write JavaScript if Node is your tool of choice. The goal is to have a list of repeatable steps. And by using that one command with the one script, you're able to do the exact same thing every single time. That way you never actually forget to do anything. But scripts ultimately rely on something to trigger that. If it's still a human, you might simply forget to run that script in the first place. Or if somebody is filling in for you for the day, maybe they won't even know that you have that script. A feature that comes baked into Git itself is Git hooks. With Git hooks, you can trigger something at different points in the Git process. For instance, you can set up a Git commit hook, where anytime you run a commit, your hook will run, automating some part of your process, where a good example is formatting. Anytime somebody actually commits, you can set up Prettier or any other kind of formatter to run before the commit actually applies. With your existing scripts to run linting and formatting, this is called a pre-commit, where with tools like Husky, you can actually hook in and manage all those Git hooks. We're also applying lint staged here, which allows us to get the path of all those changes that are actually staged inside of Git. That way, when we run our pre-commit hook, we're not actually in, uh, impacting the entire repository. We're only impacting those files that actually change that are important to us in that context. But once that script finishes, those changes are added onto the Git stage before it's actually commit and it is actually applied. So when the actual commit actually happens, all Git knows is that it has pretty formatted code. All the developers knows is that it got its job done and the code is pushed up to GitHub and it looks like one person wrote it. 
but not everything makes sense inside of a Git hook. You don't want to run your tests in a pre-commit hook, for instance. That's going to be a pain for developers. Imagine you're working on a project with a huge test suite. In order to commit, you have to run that entire thing. Nope. So we can take that up another level by running CI CD processes. CI is continuous integration and CD is continuous deployment or delivery, depending on who you ask. But while some teams still require that to be kicked off manually, that kind of defeats the purpose where the goal of CI CD is to be automated within your code process. For instance, if you push a change to your main branch that triggers a particularly particular set of functionality, if you push to a feature branch, maybe that triggers it a little bit differently. Some popular frameworks for running these processes are Jenkins, Mamboo, CircleCI, TravisCI, and depending on the framework, uh, the setup might look a little bit different, but they also kind of look the same, where most of them are kind of based on a config file, but you can also have various levels of scripting included. And while this here is a really simple example, I personally still have nightmares of my time working in Jenkins in past jobs, but I'm also primarily a front-end engineer. The DevOps team swore by Jenkins. I think it was mostly though because of the flexibility, not necessarily the ease of it. But setting up CI CD can be super, super powerful. You can have large complex orchestration of your entire infrastructure. Need to deploy some lambdas or dump your site into static storage? Add a script to your CI CD process. Need to spin up a VPC with really strict networking rules? Well, make Jenkins do it for you. Because you're actually leveraging scripting and automation of that scripting, you should really be able to accomplish anything that you want. But like I mentioned before, I'm a front end engineer and I struggled with Jenkins. I didn't have great documentation, at least at the time, and waiting for the builds to finish actually took forever. For a lot of those frameworks, you also have to maintain servers. Did I mention that I'm a front end engineer? I can spit up a node server, but I don't wanna deal with servers. Servers are so last decade, right? But kidding aside, I wanted something where I can easily plug and play, something that the rest of my code that I don't have to actually fight with. And after all that buildup, that's where GitHub Actions comes in. GitHub Actions are still technically CI CD, but in practice, they feel a lot more approachable. The best part is they can be just as flexible. With Actions, you start off by setting up the environment in the workflow file that you want to actually run on. You can then add whatever commands that you want to run, when you want to run them, and you're off. For instance, if I wanted to simply set up some tests, I can set up some test files to run on Ubuntu or a variety of other options. Then I can check out the code where I'll be running commands inside of a working directory. To set up Node, I can add an action where I specify that version. I can even make this work on a few different version, versions within my workflow. And then finally, I install all the dependencies and I run those tests. This alone will put, run my tests anytime any changes are actually pushed or if a pull request is created. As they run, they show up right in line with the rest of my actual pull request, letting you know by just a quick look if those proposed changes are going to break things or not. This helps create a really great feedback loop for developers, where if something isn't working, they'll get that feedback really quickly. I could also use GitHub Actions to deploy my code. Once I install my project dependencies, I can build that project then configure my AWS credentials as secrets, and I can sync those artifacts up to AWS for my deployment. The AWS CLI is actually available by default within GitHub Actions, so this makes it really easy to do. And this really includes any kind of commands with the AWS CLI. And I can even use actions from the GitHub Marketplace. Like if I wanted to post a message to Slack every time a new pull request is made, I can use the post Slack action which I can configure within my project to send a note right inside of Slack. It's helpful to automate the little parts of our development process and workflow, but these are some of these the simpler examples of this. But it goes to show that with a few lines of code, we can really do a lot of different things. The cool thing, though, is we can take this up another level. We can create our own GitHub Actions. Once you create a custom GitHub Action, you really gain the flexibility to do whatever you want inside of the controlled environment. You have a few different options like running JavaScript with Node or running with Docker, where you really get the ability to do whatever you want. For instance, if I have a common task that includes a bunch of complicated things, I might not want to have to copy and paste that code between every single repository. I can set up that, that Node script and script that up as a new action, where the only way I have to actually reference it between all the different projects is that one little reference. And that's exactly what I did with my Apple Tools Eyes GitHub action. 
And to add some context, AppliTools is a visual testing platform where every time you run a test, Eyes is going to take a screenshot of your website or your mobile application and compare those images with AI. Now to do that, AppliTools has a ton of different SDKs. So whether Cypress like you see here or Selenium Java or really any popular testing framework that will allow you to actually drop in those tests to your existing tests. So this is already pretty easy to do, but I wanted to make it even easier to do. I wanted a solution where maybe you don't even have testing set up and you can still drop this in. You could easily drop in some automated visual testing, which is where I come back to my Apple Tools Eyes GitHub action. And hence, this action just takes one snippet where you only have to plug in your API key, which is required anytime you want to run a test with Apple Tools to make sure that it actually associates with your account. And then you provide the URL that you actually want to test. Once that action starts off, it kicks off a process where it first crawls that URL that you pass in. It does a similar process to what you would expect for Google to do with its robots, where it clicks around the site, tracks the links that were actually available on your site, and puts it all together in a list, and can even pass in your own custom sitemap URL if that's what you prefer. But to crawl the page, I actually use a package called Sitemap Generator, where I can run a simple command and immediately have that list of URLs. Once I've collected all the site details and configurations, I was able to run Cypress right inside of my node script, including those URLs from the sitemap as an array that I pass right into Cypress, which allows me to collect all my results that I can use for later, such as failing the action if any of those tests failed, or generally working with the results for a better developer experience. But finally, Cypress runs those tests as it normally would, giving me my test runner and my results for the eyes check. Only difference being that it's looping through all those pages to check from the sitemap. But that gives me my test runner and my results for the eyes check. With those tests, I can even comment right on the pull request what's passed, failed, or unresolved, giving the maintainer of the project an easy way to know if that code actually introduced a bug, or at a minimum, if it introduced breaking changes. I even figure out a way where we can plug this into an existing Netlify workflow. If you're not familiar with Netlify, they'll automatically deploy your static application straight from GitHub. This happens anytime changes are actually pushed to your default branch. I was able to find an action where it waited for an actual Netlify deploy to finish, where it would then store that URL as output. And I passed that right into my action, which it did its thing, it crawled the site, and it performed some visual testing. But the entire project ultimately was a script that I needed to run, where running it between projects is just a few different input parameters of a difference. Instead of having to make sure that the testing framework is set up, along with installing any of the SDKs and actually writing tests, this makes it easy to add Apple Tools Eyes visual testing to any project with just those few lines. So to actually get a better sense of what GitHub Actions in a whole is actually looking like, let's do a really quick walkthrough. Here's what we're going to go through. I'm going to first show you some existing simple tests that I have set up in a repository. They're just really simple and kind of just get the idea of what tests are actually going on inside of the project. Then I'm going to set up a new GitHub action, which is going to run through all those tests right inside of the GitHub UI. We're going to see how that actually works right on GitHub. Then we're going to actually break those tests so we can see how that's going to impact our workflow. So let's dive in. So we're gonna start off with this GitHub repository that I set up where it's a basic example of a simple application that runs some logic for e-commerce applications where really the important thing for us is the context that it's an e-commerce application. And if we actually look inside of this test directory, we have two folders, we have API and lib, and I'm gonna to go to lib where we have this orders.testjs where I'm using jest to run this test on this function calculate subtotal from items where what it's going to do as kind of described, it's going to take in this array of items and it's going to calculate what that subtotal is and make sure that it's properly adding those all together. Now, this is just a real simple test that's meant to kind of demonstrate the use case of Jest that I actually used for a tutorial that I wrote, but this is a great use case to actually show how this is going to work in practice. So to prove that this is actually working properly, I actually set this repository up locally where I installed the dependencies already so I can go npm test and we can see that it's going to go through and run Jest, and it's gonna go through both of those test files, and we can see that everything's working perfectly, and everything is passing just as expected, and we know that we have active working tests. So now that we have that 
uh, ready to go, what we want to do is we want to create a GitHub action using these tests. So that way, anytime I push changes to this repository or anytime I create a pull request where somebody else creates a pull request, we can make sure that we have these tests running to make sure that nothing has actually broken anytime uh, code actually hits the repository. So to do that, we kind of have two options where one, we can create that right inside of the UI if we want, which is how we're going to run it. But alternatively, if you're actually familiar with this already, or if you find an example that you want to copy, you can do it right by creating the file in the repository or even writing it by hand. But as I mentioned, we're going to use the UI to kind of see how this looks like in practice, how you can actually get started right inside of your project today. So I'm going to head over to the actions tab inside of my project where we can see that GitHub's already gonna give us some suggestions about what we wanna run. Where what we're going to do is we're gonna start off with this Node.js action right at the top, where we can actually see that it's doing a lot of the things that we already wanna do. So I'm gonna click set up this workflow. Well, let's actually walk through what's happening here. Well, where first of all, I want to rename this file tests.yaml as this is going to be the configuration for my test. So we want to kind of describe it as it makes sense. Now, some of these comments make it a little bit harder to read as I'm kind of showing and walking through this. So I'm going to get rid of that comment, but I'm going to also set up the name of this to be tests as well to describe what's actually happening. And we can see already that we have this on mechanism, which this is going to be what triggers this workflow and job to ultimately run. And we can see we have two instances. We have the push and we have the pull request events, where anytime I push changes to the main branch or create a pull request to the main branch, it's automatically going to run. Then we head down to the job section where we have our build job, where this is just the name of it. So I'm going to change that again to tests, where we can see that once we start into the configuration of that particular job, we can see, first of all, it's going to run it on Ubuntu latest. It's going to then set up this strategy, which what this is going to do is it's going to allow us, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, to actually run these tests on multiple versions of Node from our one configuration or from our one workflow file, where it's going to go through these set of tests each time for each version of Node that we define within this array. So with that strategy, we can start moving into the actual steps of the job, where the very first thing we're going to do is it's going to check out the code for the repository. It's then going to set up Node.js within the working environment so that we can actually have Node to run. And we can see that it's even going to set up caching for our NPM. But here we see where that matrix from the strategy comes in, where every time it runs through, it's going to run for, through each of these different instances and apply that Node version depending on where it's at so that we know that each time it runs through, it's going to use that different version of Node. But then finally, as we get to the bottom of this workflow file, we see the three main parts of this actual workflow where it's going to first use NPM CI, which is a good way to run NPM install when you're on a testing environment or some kind of production environment to make sure that you're using the actual lock file. But then it's going to run build if it's actually present. Now in our case, we're not actually building anything, so I can even get rid of that if I want, even though it has that if present flag. And then finally, it's going to run NPM test. So as we look through here, what it's really doing is anytime that we have a pull request or a push up to the main branch, it's going to first check out our code. It's going to then use or install a particular version of Node.js. It's going to then install the dependencies and simply run the test. Now that's all we did, and we were able to get all of that through the actual Actions UI. But finally, once I have that all ready to go, I can head down to the very bottom of the page. I'm gonna click Start Commit, and I'm gonna commit that directly to my main branch. And we can actually see once that gets in there, we can already head over to the actions section where we can see that we now have these workflow runs. And anytime we actually run the workflow, like this very first push that we actually made to our main branch, we're gonna have that new workflow show up right inside of this UI. So we can already see that that particular commit that we made to add the workflow will trigger that the very first time. So let's click into that. And we can actually see what's going on in here, where we have all these jobs. We can see, as I described, where we have that matrix of the different node versions. So it's going to run that job for each one. And we can already see that it's starting to pass. But if I look inside of them, such as node 12, for instance, we can see the actual steps that's going on. And I'm not going to kind of open up each one of these, but it's really just the logs that are happening for each one of these different steps inside of the job. But what's important to us is this NPM test, where if I look inside of that, we can see that it went through and 
it found that each of those tests are passing just like it did locally on my environment. And we know that any time that we push the changes, as long as we don't break it, that it's going to work perfectly fine. Now, part of this is let's actually break this and see how it works when it's actually impacting the workflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a breaking change so that it's going to cause those to actually fail from within a pull request. So I'm gonna head over to the lib directory and I'm gonna actually go to that orders.js file and I'm gonna find that function that calculates subtotals from items and let's actually break this function. So I'm gonna click edit right inside the GitHub UI and I'm gonna remove this quantity multiplier. And what this is going to do is instead of saying if I have two items and calculate the cost for both of them, it's only gonna act like I have one item for each of those different item sets. So I'm gonna get rid of that multiplier and I'm gonna simply commit this, but if we scroll down, I'm gonna commit this to a new branch so that I can create a pull request based off of it. So I'm gonna propose those changes, and then I'm gonna create a new merge request or pull request for this. And we can see as soon as I actually create that pull request, we scroll down here and we see we have this checks section, which maybe if you've used a tool like Netlify or some of the other integrations at a GitHub, you might've seen the checks before, where this is a way that you can actually create your own checks using GitHub Actions. But we can see that they've already started kicking off and they're gonna go through and run those tests for the code on this particular branch as part of this pull request. So let's actually hop in. Well, we already see that they're not successful, which is what we expected because we broke this. And we're even seeing that some of them are actually canceled because others have failed. They need to be fixed. So let's check, take a look at this node 14. And if we actually click inside the details, we immediately see that we have this red X on our NPM test, which is where it failed. And we see for our different tests that those tests actually failed. And as we're looking through, we can see that the reason is because we didn't get the right value. Now, again, we totally expected this because we intentionally broke that actual function, but we can see that we were immediately able to get those results right inside of our pull request so that we can have right in line where we're actually working when we're reviewing our code to make sure that things are working or not working as we expect them to be, where we can then say that, no, this isn't valid and we can have the reviewer pass it back. Or if you're being vigilant, we can go back and try to fix those changes or just simply close the pull request because we know that this isn't working and there's, and by no means do we want to get this merged into our project. But either way, GitHub Actions, even though this is a simple example, there's a lot of different use cases for how we can expand on this, whether it's through our project or through other creative means to actually be able to enhance and automate different code tasks or everyday tasks within our different environments. All right. So let's recap and kind of get an idea of what we achieved here. Well, we first saw how easy it was to simply get a new GitHub action up and running to run existing tests. We saw how those even work right inside of the GitHub UI. We then broke those tests and we were able to see how it actually let us know right inside of that pull request that those tests were failing. Now, again, this was a really simple example and let's actually check out some of the other GitHub actions that people created out in the wild. I also created this other GitHub action template that I call content reminder. One of the things that I struggle with as a content creator and educator is just simply remembering to share some of my old content. So I put on my developer hat and I thought about something I could do about it. I built my content reminder as a GitHub action where it's simply a node script, but what happens is it runs on a cron so that it actually triggers two times every day. With actions, not only can you run on GitHub events, you can actually run on the same old cron syntax that you're used to scheduling runs. But once it does run, I run a node script where I look through a few RSS feeds of my content, find a random entry, and then I end up sending myself an email with that content, pushing me to share it out to the world. For another practical use case, performance is or should be at the top of everybody's mind when building web applications. Lighthouse is a fantastic tool from the GitHub, from the Google team rather, that helps to actually measure performance. The Lighthouse CI action is a drop-in where you can take those measurements right inside of your GitHub project. And it's not too different from my Apple tools action, where we can pass in the URL right into the Lighthouse CI action. We can also define a performance budget, such as ma uh, maximum page size, where when Lighthouse runs, it'll take that budget into consideration. 
And if it finds any issues, it'll add those annotations right inside of GitHub, letting us know what the issues are with our current project. Actually bringing things into the real world, Alfonso created Issuetron 3000 for a GitHub hackathon. Whenever a new issue is created, Issuetron 3000 will send a signal to an IoT device. And while admittedly I'm not too familiar with the IoT world, setup is similar to any other different action, where there's extensive documentation for how to actually configure this kind of thing. But ultimately, it's going to run a script that Alfonso set up inside of the action, where it's set up to run on an MQTT client, and it sends a payload depending on the event. And once received, issue three. Issuetron 3000 is activated and blinks or lights up based on your configuration. It works pretty well in the video. I'll include a link in my talk notes. And finally, if this last one wasn't considered fun, here's a little bit of some fun, where Tim created a community chess game right on his GitHub profile page, powered by GitHub Actions. To make a new move, anybody can click on one of the links to a specific space, where all it's doing is opening up a new GitHub issue with that location inside of the title. Once the action sees the open request, it ultimately runs a Ruby script where it's actually going to set up the play, including actually parsing out the title for where that next move should be, along with a lot of other stuff that I'm not showing here in this simple screenshot, as well as updating the readme with the new move. Where ultimately, if your move is accepted by Tim, it will show up right on Tim's profile. And if you're persistent enough, you might even get to show up on his leaderboard. But whatever you do with actions, the ultimate goal is to automate as much of your code tasks as you can. Again, let the robots do the hard work and be the bad cops. Spend your time on the unique challenges of your project. The great thing about actions, though, is it makes it very approachable for anybody to use. I no longer have to get stressed out when doing CI CD workflows. I love setting up a new action and figuring out what I can do with it or what I can actually get automated. I get excited seeing something run automatically that I no longer have to do myself, and I'm sure you will too. If you want to learn how to create your own custom GitHub action, or if you want a quick intro about generally how actions work, I have a bunch of resources, including an egghead course and a bunch of videos on YouTube. And if you want to learn how you can go from end-to-end -end design all the way up to a full stack Next.js application, including automating those code tasks with GitHub actions, check out my free course on YouTube, where you can find it at fromdesign2.dev. And that's it. If you want to learn or more uh, or chat about the talk, you can find me again everywhere at Colby Fayok. I'll also tweet out some of the links that you've seen here today. Thanks, everybody.